take an opportunity. I know earlier this year we had Bob Lenz here as we started rolling out the Dignity Revolution. And I gave a little intro to what we were looking at doing, but tonight I want to dig a little deeper into some of the issues that we've seen um, in our own district as well as across the state and across our nation. And so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the silent epidemic, and then we'll kind of go into a little bit of some activities um, statistics, that's what the chairs are for as a visual aid. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the curriculum and some of the things that we're doing. We had our third session today with students, and uh, Mr. Nelson, I'll talk a little bit about some of those sessions. But um, to start off, last spring I had the opportunity to go to the National Superintendents Conference, and it was at that point that I started really hearing a lot more about what uh, the media and different people are calling the silent epidemic in our nation. And I would say that 75% of the sessions at the conference dealt with social emotional learning, um, mental well-being of our youth, and it was at that point that things became a lot more real, and it, it was probably March we started putting together how do we address this moving forward. And so that's where Dignity Revolution came from, was we started looking into that and, and building for this year and rolling that out. Now, the silent epidemic, what is it? It's called the silent epidemic for two reasons. One, you don't hear a lot about it because it's not covered by media very often. As well as that it's sometimes a tough topic to talk about. Nobody wants to talk about youth depression, youth anxiety, um, self-harm and suicide. We just don't want to talk about it. It's not comfortable to talk about. I don't like talking about it up here, but I think that at some point we have to have the conversation about what's going on um, with the youth across our country. It's also something that uh, there's, there's no one in the world that's exempt from it. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your education level. It doesn't matter if you come from a two-parent, one-parent home. You know, what socioeconomic status you come from. It doesn't matter if you're good in school, if you're good at sports, if you're not, it doesn't matter. I can tell you story after story that I've read about, about people that are very successful that end up in depression with anxiety or end up committing suicide or attempting suicide. And so a lot of these things are, are tough to deal with. They're tough to talk about. You don't hear a lot about them. But, you know, why are our students dealing with some of these things? Some of it is that, you know, societal norms are to the point where everybody has to fit this mold. Society tells us that we have to look this way, act this way, we have to have this much money, this type of job. And it starts putting pressures on kids to be somebody they're not. And that's tough to deal with when you're talking kids that are 14, 15, 16 years old. Social media doesn't help. If I post on Facebook, if I post on Snapchat, Instagram, I have to appear that everything is great. That my life looks like this, but it doesn't. And so you hide behind that, and if that ever crumbles, then what? You know, a lot of times I heard, I've heard people say, you know, it was, it was tough when we were growing up too. And I said, yeah, it could be. There was issues we dealt with. Each one of us sitting in this room dealt with some type of an issue when we were growing up. But I remember that if I had a problem, I could escape that problem. Kids nowadays don't have an escape from some of this stuff. It's there 24 seven. And so those are things that are tough. You know, one thing that you hear a lot about is bullying. Uh, one thing I really like about the Dignity Revolution curriculum is it really does a nice job of explaining what bullying is, as well as the different types um, and the different people involved in it. And you know, uh, one thing when you look at bullying is that, and this is something we've talked with all our kids the first day that we did this, was that bullying is a repeated action. that you've asked them to stop and they won't. And day after day, that's repeated. Um, like I explained to kids, especially at the elementary level, for those of you who have elementary kids, if you're running in from recess and you want to be the first one and you shove somebody out of the way, that's not bullying. That's just not being very nice. Now, if every day you go 
target that kid at recess and you go shove him into the ground and throw snow in his face day after day, week after week. And that's bullying and that is a different scenario. And then you have the people that are bystanders, the people that don't have the courage to stand up for others. They just stand and watch. Why? Because they don't want to be that person. So they'll just stand and watch because it's not me. And then you have people that hopefully get to the point, and this is what we want with our kids, is to be the upstanding. To stand up for somebody else. To stand in the gap when those kids are being picked on. So, the silent epidemic, it's a multifaceted issue. The lady that came from Sioux Falls earlier this year and spoke to our kids probably said it the best. She used the, the example of playing the game of Jenga with kids. It's not one, two, three things that get to them or bother them. It's multiple things, and you start pulling those things out. It might be family problems. It might be getting bullied by somebody at school, problems in school, um, extracurricular activities, boyfriend, girlfriend. You start going down the list, and pretty soon you pull enough of those out, and what happens? The tower topples over. And that's what it becomes with some of these social emotional pressures with our kids. Oftentimes it's not one thing we can point to. It's multiple things that we're dealing with and they're dealing with. And the goal tonight is to hopefully help you understand that there are issues that our kids are dealing with. We can't ignore it. We can't run away from it. We have to recognize it. We have to try to come and work together. Uh, to come against it. These chairs out here today represent, there's 88 of them, if you want to count, be my guest. Uh, these chairs represent the 88 kids that go to school in this building. And I know some of you uh, maybe have elementary kids and you say, well, I don't have a kid in this building. Well, trust me, you will soon, okay? I have a senior this year and I didn't think it would happen that quick and it did. Um, it was, it seems like yesterday he was in elementary school. And I didn't think it would get to this point this quick, but it does. So if you have elementary kids, um, thanks for being here. They'll be at this level and dealing with things like this sooner than you know. 88 students in this building, um, 7 through 12. A couple statistics for you. This is nationally statistics. Um, 15 to 19 year old kids is what they're dealing with in a 12 month period. So out of 88 kids, um, statistics say that 31% deal continually with thoughts of depression, anxiety, hopelessness, and worthlessness. 31% of kids 15 to 19 years old. That's these front chairs here in front of me. That represents 31% of our kids in this room. That's the number of kids that deal with those types of issues. Out of those 27 kids, 17% of kids deal with thoughts of suicide. That's these 15 chairs. So in a school our size, you got 15 represented right here that deal with thoughts of it. 14% make a plan to act. That's those 12 chairs right here. 12 kids make a plan to act and carry out a plan of suicide. Now, of those, we have seven percent actually act and attempt suicide in students 15 to 19 years old in the United States of America. That's those six chairs right here in front. One chair is too many, in my mind. But six out of 88, that's a lot. Every two hours in the United States of America, a uh, 15 to 19 year old kid dies from suicide. That's 12 per day. Um, it's a problem facing every, every state. Believe it or not, anybody know what South Dakota is in the nation for teen suicides? Fourth. Two is right. 
We're second behind Alaska, which is crazy. Uh, rural, for the most part, farming communities, we're second in the nation. Those are just a few stats. that hopefully paint a picture of what we're up against. So the question is, is why is this happening? What has changed over the last 30 years? Um, last 20 years probably even. Um, teen suicide has tripled or quadrupled in the last 20 years. Um, some places say that they report up to 60% of kids having thoughts at that age level. You know, a lot of it is that what we said before about pressures, and we're going to do an activity that, uh, um, that is part of the Dignity Revolution curriculum that I thought they, they did for us when they trained our staff, that I thought was a great uh, visual aid and indicator of what kids deal with. Could I get a volunteer, preferably a female if I could? Anybody? Hey, thank you. All right, so this backpack right here is gonna represent your kid, our kids. Um, thanks, Carrie. Could you wear this for me? It's not the greatest backpack. It has a little wear to it, but hopefully it'll be all right. And, and one of the straps is kind of... All right, you good? All right. So the backpack represents um, our, our students. I'm going to start putting some things in this backpack. Uh, here's one extracurricular activities, sports. Something that a lot of our kids are involved in, and that's great, but it can also be a huge amount of stress for our kids. I'm going to put that in. Tell me if you need some help. Here's another one. Uh, we all deal with it, right? Family problems. This might be problems with parents, might be problems with siblings. Maybe your cousins, you're in the same class, maybe. For students, social media, it's a big one. Uh, they all have multiple accounts. I've lost track of all the different platforms that there are. Um, I finally got a Twitter account, and my kid said, whoa, that's way old school, Dad. You should have something else. I finally jumped on board, and it's actually just a school one. I have, I think, 12 followers. <laughs> Respect or lack of respect, maybe, for students. How, how you feeling? Oh, heavy. Right, it's getting heavy. We got a little ways to go. Uh, alcohol, vaping, tobacco, other types of abuse of substances. This one back here to you. Anxiety, depression, worthlessness. You all right? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Low self-esteem. Academic problems. Out of room. I am. I'm, I'm going to try to find some more, though. <laughs> all right, we might not get all these in here. Let's do this. We got peer pressure and unhealthy relationships left. We're just going to kind of Throw that in there. You just hold on to that. <laughs> okay, how you feel right now? Heavy. Yeah, overwhelmed. All right, now my question becomes this. Our kids come to school and they go to Algebra 1. How do I fit this in here? It doesn't, right? How do I fit American Lit? It doesn't work. It doesn't fit. That's what's happening to some of our kids nowadays. They're bringing all these things with them and they need some help to unload and to get rid of some of these stresses because they don't need to be carrying all these things around. So our goal is to help them try to 
learn how to manage and to handle these things and where to go to find help with some of these things. If you want to just take it off, that'd be great. Mrs. Clark later and get yourself a teacher. Oh. Thanks for helping. But it's pretty hard for us to expect top-notch academic performance in our classrooms when we know kids are bringing things with them to school. And not just kids, I hate to say it, we bring it to um, adults. Now we're supposed to be able to handle those things, right? We're supposed to have the knowledge and the experience to handle situations. But I'm telling you, we deal with the same thing sometimes. Uh, one thing I like to tell staff, and this is hard, it took me seven or eight years to figure this out as an administrator, that when I walk through the door every morning, I leave whatever I'm bringing with me from home at the door. And I also leave whatever I want to take home with me at the door when I walk out. It's not fair to our students if I bring it with me, and it's not fair to my family if I bring it home. But that's hard to do. It's hard to learn how to do. And it's even tougher when you're 15, 16, 17 years old because they're sitting in math class and they're worried about what was posted last night on social media. And what am I gonna say when I see that person? How am I gonna act? when I see that person? What are they gonna say if I raise my hand and ask that question? What's gonna be said about me later? And so, it becomes a tough scenario for students and for educators and for parents to see, find ways to help our students cope with these things and to get past them and learn life lessons and skills and tools to use to help them be successful, not just now, but down the road. And the one thing that I hope you understand is that this is a real problem. It is an epidemic. I don't care what anybody says. The statistics show. Um, just this year, since the start of school, this is what I, these are ones I know of in the state of South Dakota. In the first nine weeks, there's been 12 high school students that have committed suicide. Now, you don't hear about it much, do you? But that's what's happened. That doesn't include all of them that have attempted it or the ones that weren't reported that way. But it is a real problem. It is something we must realize, recognize. And if we don't rise up against it, nobody else will. The problem is, is that you can't do it by yourself and I can't do it by myself. The school is one piece to the puzzle. Our communities are one piece to the puzzle. But the most important piece of the puzzle are you sitting in the stands right now. And I would put myself there because I have two sons. Parents, you're the most important resource in fighting this battle. You may not realize it, your kids may not think you're that cool. They may not want to spend time with you. But trust me, research shows, and I will tell you after talking to the number of kids I've talked to, parents hold the most cards out of anybody. They believe in you, they will listen to you, and they need you. That's what it comes down to. Um, can I share about the first session? Do you need a revolution? Yeah, Mr. McNeil and I did that one. So Mr. McNeil and Mr. Nelson had our nine seniors in, uh, in the first session of Dignity Revolution. The question was asked, how many of you have real conversations on a regular basis with your parents? How many hands went up? Any ideas? How many? One. You're close. Two, two. Two. Two out of nine. That's 22%. Two kids said, yep, regular conversation, sit down and talk about what's going on with my parents. The other seven don't. So who are they talking to? Communication 
There's three different types, right? Mm -hmm. Student to student, student to adult, adult to adult. Who do you think students go to most regularly when they have a problem? Other students. That's not always a bad thing. We understand that. That's why we're trying to train our students to help in a ways, because a lot of times they're the first ones to see a need. But eventually, I hope that with your students, your kids, that it becomes student to adult. Because uh, that's what they need. That's what, uh, that's what they want. Whether they tell you that or not, that is what they want. The one thing that we've seen over time, and, and like I said, I, I took in a lot of sessions when I was out at the National Superintendents Conference. And when I got back, I was making phone calls to administrators all over the country trying to find out what I thought was the best situation to address this problem in our communities. Now, it's not going to be the same in every community, in every school district. Um, I talked to the Yale University for Emotional Intelligence and went through some of their programs. We talked with other places all over this country that deal with this stuff. And we kept coming back to Dignity Revolution and Bob Lentz's curriculum for one specific purpose. Because a lot of what we were looking at for the other stuff dealt with the surface. We see this act and I'm going to, I'm going to handle that and we're gonna to try to punish that act and we're gonna to try to stop that, what I would call surface behavior. But we didn't get, they didn't get underneath the surface to the root problem. And one thing that we've learned is that a lot of times kids act the way they do because they're dealing with something themselves. Even though you may not see it, they're dealing with something as well. One thing that was said to me that kind of stuck with me was that hurting people hurt others. And that's true with kids. If they're dealing with something, they want to try to make themselves feel better by watching somebody else suffer. And that sounds terrible. But that's reality. And that's the society we live in. Is that a lot of times our society says we don't want to see other people succeed. If we can't succeed, nobody else can. And so when it comes to trying to get to the root of these things, in my mind it comes down to the three things that are on the back of Mr. Nelson's shirt on our staff shirts. Value. Students have to value, people have to value others and value themselves. So many of our kids, that was the number one thing that shocked me when I started looking into and pouring into some of the research was that kids nowadays, in general, feel worthless. How is that possible? You are a masterpiece, you are priceless, but they feel worthless. They have no value. Why is that? We got to change that. Not just about themselves, but about how they see other people. Courage. Kids have to learn to have the courage to stand up. I told the kids at the elementary the other day a story that I'm not proud of. Some of you that uh, maybe have seen Bob Lentz, he tells a story about Jack. Anybody ever heard Jack's story? I got a similar story. Mine's Jeremy. And Jeremy was my friend. And uh, after a pep rally, I went to a school of 800. After a pep rally for the basketball team, which I was fortunate enough to be a part of as a sophomore, the only sophomore, and I thought I was cool. I thought I was something special because I'm the only one up here playing with the juniors and seniors. I can't screw this up. Jeremy was a junior friend of mine that got cut from the basketball team. Well, he got duct taped at center court after the pep rally. And he was flopping around like a fish out of water. And what do you think I did? You think I helped him? I couldn't. I couldn't take that chance. I walked by. Even kind of snickered and chuckled a little bit with the rest of the guys. I didn't have courage. I didn't have courage to do the right thing, stand up. No matter what had happened to me, 
But that's what we want for our kids, is to learn how to have the courage to stand up and say, knock it off. You're not going to do that. And the last one is respect. And it really comes down to having not just respect for others, but respect for ourselves. And a lot of our kids don't have respect for themselves. And the reason I can say that is because of their actions. And uh, some of the things they're involved with don't show respect for themselves. If, they, if we can get that trained and ingrained in our students, I think a lot of the surface behaviors will stop. A lot of the things that we're seeing right now will stop. But the problem is, is that we're fighting against society in general. Because all of those three things go against what society is selling. And not just on social media, but any TV show or movie you see, you can't even watch the news. Everything we're trying to teach kids, they do the opposite. Politicians. Sports stars, celebrities, they're terrible. They're terrible to each other. And we're supposed to be able to tell kids not to do that? The people that they supposedly look up to, they do it. And that's why the first day of in-service, I told our staff, we have to model this behavior. And as a parent, if I don't model this behavior, I'm never going to see it in my students in my kids. They're not gonna they're not gonna do this. Before we go on to uh, I wanna highlight a little bit of what, what Dignity Revolution does and some of the things that incorporate the value, courage and respect. But before we get to that point, does anybody have questions? I, I'm not an expert by any means. I've done a lot of research, I have a lot of experience but uh, I can speak for myself, and I'm, I'm pretty confident I can speak for all of our staff. We genuinely want what's best for your kids. We care about your kids. We care about every student in our school. Um, but we can't do it alone. We've got to have your help, and that's why we're having these things today. We want you to know what we're doing with some of the curriculum and some of the classrooms, the discussions we're having. So hopefully that conversation can continue at home. So you can have some of the same thoughts behind it. Um, so any questions? I know it's a lot to, to, to process. It's a lot to take in. Um, I'll be here afterwards if you want to talk or Mr. Nelson will. Um, I'm going to highlight a couple of things, and then I'm going to let Mr. Nelson highlight a couple that they've done more at the high school. So, this is the curriculum we're using right now. One's the elementary, one's the, the middle school, high school edition. And they're, they're, they're obviously not the same because we're not going to treat a kindergarten for a second grader the same as we do a ninth, 10th, 11th grade. And, and they're going to have different conversations. but. It's been pretty awesome to see the younger kids. I've been in and out of most of the classrooms in the elementary, how they've responded to some of these things. Um, the first lesson really got down to talking about what we talked about a little bit ago. What is bullying? What's a bystander? What's an upstander? Um, another one got into talking about good friends versus bad friends, how to surround yourself with good relationships. Um, Try to avoid the unhealthy relationships, the people that take advantage of you, um, maybe even laugh at you, make fun of you. Those aren't your real friends. Uh, you don't need those people. You need the real friends. Um, each student in the elementary has their dignity dictionary that they can refer back to. The younger kids, they cut and paste, draw pictures to represent the different things, whether it be the bystander, the upstander, um, those types of things. Um, down the road, we'll have ones that will talk in the older grades about uh, what Mr. Nelson dealt with. I want him to explain a little bit about what they did today. In a, in a touch base, our, you know, our first unit we did was exactly what Mr. Clarks did in the elementary. is identify what is bullying. 
And it's very interesting when you ask a 14 to 18 to 19 year old student what bullying is. They all know what it is, but they all have a different definition of it. Okay, and that's why it's so difficult to pinpoint is, as Mr. Clark said, a shove because I was being rude and disrespectful or that's an everyday occurrence. And as the curriculum progressed, we went into something today talking about stress. You got to see Ms. Ratchin stand up here with, with Sarah's backpack on. The amount of stress that she came to school with today. So what we did, uh, Mr. McNeil and I and all my staff here, our curriculum is a little bit different. It's more aimed at the middle and the high school level, a little bit more older, mature conversation. We gave him a big piece of poster board and had him draw a silhouette of a person. And we had them list the organs that are affected by stress. So you had the brain, you had the heart, the lungs, the stomach, the skin, the eyes, the mouth, the throat, etc. And they had three and a half minutes to draw this and put those organs down. And then we went to the second tier. And that was to what are the effects of stress on your body? What does it do to your stomach, to your eyes, to your brain, to your lungs, to your heart? And what was our numbers in our group today? 20, 20 some. So 24, 25 in three minutes. A group of four and five students were able to come up with 25 almost each per group of the number of things that they have found that create stress and what it does to their body. Everything from acne on your face and your skin to sour stomach, heartburn, anxiety, etc. And we were done, we got to notice, and I have all the teachers send a reflection of how their day went. And we, we would share those reflections with each other in the school and with Mr. Clark. And as, this was a great lesson today from what I, what I perceived, that the kids were engaged. They understood what stress does to their body. But the biggest part, they were able to identify, you know what? I feel a stomach ache too. I have a big test, I feel nauseous. I get a headache when I have to, to overthink that I have homework tonight, I have a basketball game, and I have this. I get anxiety and start sweating when I have to get up and speak in front of people. We all have those same occurrences in our life. One thing or another, stress creates hardship on our organs and our body. And it was a great reflection to see our young students identify those things. They know what stress is. They know the types of stress that are there, self-inflicted, some is, is societal, some is, et cetera. It's everything that was in that backpack tonight. And it's good to see these kids adopting and having true conversations about the issues that they're dealing with and the stresses that are in their life. Just as Mr. Clark said to you, we all have stress. We all have something going on in our life. But often at times, it's like maybe some of our kids have extra stress brought on by other circumstances. Imagine if 25 things could happen to your body, according to my group today, 25 things. That's a lot for one person to take in. And so that's, that's what we have done. In our second unit, we did the species test, S-P-E-I-C-E-S. -E -E it was a wellness test in seven areas, emotional, mental, physical, um, ethical, etc. What a great observation tool that was for our students to actually see if they were honest with themselves. Questions range everything from, I can, I should be, I'm really nice to people. Five to one was the scale. If they're honest, they'll get a score. And it was interesting to listen to the conversation that our young people were saying. You know, I know I'm strong here, I should work at this area a little bit better. I thought I was a better person than I am on this. So this curriculum is extremely relevant. 
I am very proud of it. I will stand by it all day long. It is a strong piece of, of curriculum for social emotional learning. And it will work. It's going to work. I think our kids are starting to understand what it is. So that's what we have done in three units in, in, in the high school and in the middle school. And it's good stuff. It's, it's all relevant. Thank you. <clears throat> How many in here saw Bob Lentz's example with a $5 bill? Most of you did? Okay, you did, okay. So for those of you who didn't, I, if, if there was less of you, I was gonna show you the example. Um, anybody not see it? Who didn't see it? Maybe there's enough that, okay. Anybody have a $5 bill on them? Maybe? I do. Okay. You just can if you give it back. I need a five. Right here. Oh, all right, thanks. So, five dollar bill right here. How much is this worth? Five bucks, right? So if I, if I look at it and I say, well, you're terrible five, you're not as good as your big brother the ten. You're never gonna be as good as the big brother ten. You're, you're worthless. How much is it still worth? Five dollars, right? What if I take it and I crumple it up? I'll throw it on the ground. Stomp on it. Still worth how much? Five bucks, right? I put it in my pocket and ignore it. Kind of forget about it in there, wash it once or twice, and then wear my pants next time and find my five dollars again. How much is it worth? Oh, crap. Ripped it, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll tape it later for you. Still worth five bucks, right? What happens if I take it and I tear it in half? Still worth five bucks, right? Two fifty? Yeah. Six inch, right? So what if I tear it again? That's some good fibers. Still worth how much? Five bucks. As long as you have all the pieces, you can take it back to the bank. Did you know that? I did not know that. The kids, kindergarten through sixth grade, oh, it was amazing to see their reaction when you tore it. We actually tore it one more time. I'm not going to because I'm hoping you can take it back to the bank, right? <laughs> um, so, so, uh, but, the example is, is that no matter what has happened to this $5 bill so far, it hasn't lost its value. And the same is true with people. Things happen, things are said to you. You go through things in life, and no matter what has happened to you, you still haven't lost your value. And that's an important lesson for kids to learn, because so many times we associate how we feel, what we've went through, how people have acted towards us, and we put our value and our trust in those things instead of things that will last. Um, there's certain things that can be taken away from you. There's certain things that can be. Um, your dignity shouldn't be able to be taken away from you. Uh, POW camps, that's what they tried to do. They tried to take away dignity because they knew that they could break them. And so those are things. There's 10 bucks back for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, those are the things we did, and uh, we actually took the $5 bill that we tore up in the elementary, and we actually glued it on the wall, and we put some words with it that no matter what's happened to you, you haven't lost your value. And those kids walk by every day to lunch, and I know they've talked about it. I had a mom sent me a note saying that their son wanted to buy a, an Xbox game and brought her this ratty old $10 bill and said, here's 10 bucks for my game, Mom. I know it's pretty ugly and ratty, but it hasn't lost its value. <laughs> Just like people, Mom. And he explained the whole thing to his mom that night at home. And so these things do get in, and I think you're going to see a change as we go through this. And it's just like common core math. That first year was here. Anybody remember that year? <laughs> I remember that year. It was terrible. All of a sudden, there's a new way to do math. Are you kidding me? I only know about an algorithm, and then if I don't solve it like uh, 
Mr. Schwartz told me to in, in ninth grade math, I'm not going to get it right. And so, but now, those kids that have been in it for six years, it's amazing their number sense and their ability to solve problems in multiple ways and actually understand why they did that. <coughs> You know, I think the same is true with some of the things that we're talking about right now with Dignity Revolution. You may not see it in every student. It may take some time, but I think you'll see a difference if we stick with it and if we work together. Um, some of the other things I'll just highlight quick. Uh, there's, a, there's a lesson coming up down the road that talks about uh, masks. And we talked about that a little bit with social media and stuff, that people wear masks a lot. You know, you walk down the hall and, okay, how you doing today? Good, I'm good, I'm good. Okay, that's great. Um, sometimes curious what would happen if you said, I'm terrible today. What would happen? Would they say, oh, what's going on? Or would they just say, oh, that's good. <laughs> just keep going because they're used to hearing what? Oh, I'm great. Um, one thing that we've learned and it comes down to communication. And this was the first thing I told students on the first day of school here at the high school. I said, when you're going through problems and when you're struggling with something, the best thing to do is put your phone and social media away and go have a real conversation with somebody. It's hard for me to say, I'm doing great if my eyes are red and you can tell I'm struggling with something. It's easy for me to say it behind the screen. But so many times we want to hide behind something and pretend that everything's great when it's not. And uh, they don't want to be made fun of. They don't want to be looked down upon because for years, if we talk about the conversation we're having tonight about depression, anxiety, self-harm, suicidal thoughts, people look down on them like there's something terribly wrong with them. The way I see it is, my kid has asthma. He has an inhaler. Kids have problems with maybe their muscles or feet. Maybe they're dyslexic. Those are all things that we go out and we get help for. But we don't want to help in this. We don't want to, we're too proud we're embarrassed to talk about it. We don't want to go get the help we need. These are things that we need to have conversations amongst ourselves, with our kids. It's okay. At some point, we're going to have to realize that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to have problems. We all have them. There isn't one person in here that is immune from problems. We all have dealt with situations. Kids need to understand it's okay. I don't have to try to be perfect. I don't have to fit into this mold over here. So that's one of the lessons that the older kids talk about. And one of the best ones that I think they have in there, and uh, hopefully most of you, I think, have a copy of this, right? If you don't have a copy of this, come and see me tonight. Um, they did leave enough. Um, all of our staff got one, so they had one. They left us enough copies that if my math is right, every family could get one in our district. We were trying to hand them out at parent-teacher conferences, so if I didn't get to you, I do have some with me tonight. Come and see me afterwards. We want to make sure you have a copy of this book. But in here, in one part, it talks about the old system versus the new system. And there's one that they call, what's your status? And it talks about how we judge other people. And we all do it. Sometimes it's the first time we meet somebody, right? We judge them on appearance and everything else. The old system or society system of judging others is based on the P's. Physical appearance, popularity, power, pleasure, performance, prestige, and possessions. That last one's a big one for kids. I gotta drive the right car, I gotta wear the right jeans, I can't, I gotta wear the right type of shoes. I bought these shoes for my kid, and he's like, Nautica, what's Nautica? It's not Nike, Dad. Well, okay, I'll keep them. 
luckily we wear the same size now. So, but a lot of times that's what we base it on. How people look, how popular are they, what type of position do they have, what type of car do they drive, what type of shoes do they wear. That's what we base our judgments on. Instead, we should be basing them on character, courage, compassion, commitment, consistency, creativity, and even some charity. Do they help other people? Those are things that will last forever. The other stuff can all be taken away. So one of the lessons really dives deep into talking about how we judge other people. One of the things that is incorporated within this curriculum, and this is something that we're asking for your help, is the Dignity Pledge. And we took, where is the curriculum at? This is the pledge in the curriculum right here. It says, I pledge to be kind, I pledge to be loving, I pledge to be peaceful, patient, good, um, bring joy to people, Faithful, gentle, have self-control, and to try to be a friend to all. That's good. That's pretty basic in my mind, which is fine. But we adapted it to our own needs. And we tried to incorporate to be respectful to them. We incorporated most of those things in it. But we added some things in it. Because we wanted to make sure that the components of value, courage, and respect were in the pledge as well. And so you're getting a copy right now. Your kids got a copy of this today, especially those that have seventh through 12th graders. I don't know if you saw the news tonight. KSFY was down today and did a little story on some of the stuff we're doing. So K through three, um, our elementary teachers, our lower elementary teachers, are super creative, I'm not, but they got together and just like 4-H has a pledge and some of these other things, they created their own Hitchcock Tuller Dignity Pledge that they say before they do their stuff. They actually did it for the news guy today and he recorded it. Um, if you have Twitter, you can check out my Twitter, whatever it's called, feed or account or something. It's, it's at H-T-S-U-P-T, the short for superintendent, at H-T, S-U-P-T. So you can check it out. It's on there, the whole thing, them saying it. I'm not trying to get more followers here, but I only have 12. <laughs> um, it's okay, I feel good about that. <laughs> um, it was pretty cool because I shared that with Bob Lentz and his team, and they have a ton of followers, unlike me. Um, <laughs> so they retweeted it. And it was pretty awesome to see how many people got to see our students doing that. But back to the pledge. This is something we, we didn't want students to just sign and say, oh, my name's there. It's something we want them to think about, to contemplate. And we don't expect every student to bring it back sign. We just don't. That's not how life works. We have 88 kids. Guarantee you, those, not all 88 are going to buy into this. You'll never get 100%. We don't have 100% of the parents here tonight. It won't happen. My goal was 80% whenever I try to do something. If I get 80% of the people, that's great. But that's sometimes a stretch. But that's the reality. Some of our kids, especially juniors and seniors, they're, they're hardcore hooked into society right now, into what they've seen for the last 15, 16 years, it's going to be hard to change their habits. Some of the younger kids, it's going to be a little bit easier. You're going to get someone, they're going to buy into it. They're going to see the need. They're going to, they're going to want to change. But not all of them. So we don't expect all of them to do it. We hope they take it. They reflect on this. They reflect on the first three sessions that we've had with the students before they sign this. We've also asked that the parents sign it. We also ask that you support the Dignity Revolution here. And this is kind of a student one, but to show support, you can go online and you can sign the pledge online at dignitypledge.com, or you can take that form right there and sign it. 
and uh, send it back to the school. Maybe post it on your refrigerator. Have the conversation about some of these things with your kids. I don't care if they're 17 years old. These are great conversations to have with any age of kids because it's life lessons that will only help them be successful in their future. So that's a little bit of a snapshot. From the bottom of my heart, I appreciate you guys being here. We're excited about doing this. I know it's not an easy topic to talk about. I know it's not always easy to try to have these conversations with your kids. But please, take the time to talk to your kids. To sit down and have the conversation. For those of you who maybe those kids aren't at this level yet, start forming a relationship so when they get to this age, it's an easy conversation versus a hard one. Because it comes down to relationships. And if you have that relationship with your kids, this is a lot easier. We won't have 22% say they have regular conversations with their parents. We'll have 82% instead. And that's what, we're, that's what we're shooting for. Any questions, comments? That's a great question. I, w I, w I wish I had an answer for it. I would love to get ideas from people. The question, if you didn't hear, was that what can we do from a community standpoint? What can we implement from a community side of things outside the school to show the students of our district that there's support from a community standpoint and not just from school at home? And, and that's a big thing. And, and I don't know if there's a way to form a a community type organization where people know that they have certain people to go to and to talk to and that there's people available if you need it because sometimes it is hard for kids to go talk to us or talk to you because they feel like they've let you down they feel like um, you're going to be upset with them and you're not going to respect them anymore um, so that's that's something that right now we're feeling our way through some of this stuff if I had all the answers, I'd write a book. And I wouldn't be working here anymore. Um, but I would love to hear people's ideas about forming some of the, uh, whether it be a Hitchcock two-layer um, support, community support group. You know, Spink County kind of has a youth supports group. We can tap into that a little bit. But again, that's a lot broader spectrum than what it would be from our own level here. And there's that old African proverb that says it takes a village to raise a kid. A lot of truth to that. It doesn't just happen with one person. Uh, grandparents are important people. Community members, neighbors, aunts and uncles. Those people are important people in the lives of our kids and in getting them to the point they need to be with physical, mental, and emotional well-being. So if I had an answer, I'd give you one today. I would love to incorporate something down the road. Once again, you know, uh, if people get together and talk, you know, Pastor Laura would be a great resource to see how we could incorporate some of these things in the community. I appreciate you being here tonight. Um, and right now, our focus is trying to figure out how we how we do it in the school and how we make this work. Um, tonight is is one component of what we're trying to do to try to educate and to communicate with parents because we want this to be uh, a little bit broader than just a classroom activity. And so we did record this tonight. We're going to post it on YouTube. I'm glad you were here, but I do know that life is busy. And right now, a lot of guys in the field, a lot of people in the field, a lot of people doing things that are very important to their livelihood, and we understand that. So, if you know people that weren't here, if you have relatives that maybe don't even live here, 
Tell them to go check it out. We'll post a link. I'll, I'll text out a link when we have it um, up. But please share that with other people. Um, I know this isn't perfect. Uh, you know, I'm probably one of the least qualified people to be talking about this. But at the same time, I have a lot of experience, done a lot of research. And it's something I'm really passionate about. Um, we don't go into education for any other reason other than we love kids and we want to see what's best for kids. And so, anybody else have an answer for that question? Words of encouragement and affirmation are huge for all ages, including adults, right? Um, so, yeah, being there, being at the activities, um, that's one thing that I've always appreciated about these communities is they've always supported things associated with kids, whether it be ball games, concerts. Those are things that are important for kids to see you at. That's a great idea. Thank you. But please bring ideas, talk amongst yourself. If you guys, if you guys want to run with something, we will support that. Um, you know, if you want to run with a community type organization or activities outside of here, our facilities are always available. So, you know, if you want to put some things on, that's great. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. How often are you doing these um, curriculum pieces? Once we, a week, once a month? We do it twice a month right now. We do it every other Tuesday. So today we did it. So then we'll do it um, in two weeks. And we call it a VCR day, is what we call it. And, uh, and then all of our staff have these shirts. I changed into this Dignity Revolution one. But, uh, and they all, so the staff wear them on those days so the kids know. Most of our kids have Dignity Revolution wristbands or they can earn them at the high school for certain things. Um, staff have them. So we're trying to just get kids to think about it um, in those ways. So, but yeah, good question. Thank you. Anything else? Well, again, thank you so much for coming tonight. Please share with other people what you heard tonight. Have a conversation with your kids. Um, we did have some, I know they'll be available at both places. We did have some shirts printed up. Dignity Revolution with the, I think it's on the left sleeve, HT logo on the sleeve. Um, just to kind of promote it, they're, the funds that we make, which isn't much, off of one, we'll just go back into what we're trying to do with the Dignity Revolution. They're 10 bucks. If you like the bigger sizes, they're 12. Um, Carrie, don't forget to get yours for being a great sport for us. Um, so if you want a shirt or want something, they go. We have youth small up to triple extra large. I think we only have one triple extra large left. Uh, so, but uh, in different colors. So, but we'll be around. If you didn't get a book, please come and see me. All right. Thanks for coming.